So uh, tonight we're going to continue verse by verse in our study in our 10-part message series from the book of James titled Lessons in Practical Christianity. So we're going to turn to James chapter 1 if you're not already there. James chapter 1. I've already begun the first installment. This will be part two. But most, I'm going to do a little quick review because it's been a while. It's been a few weeks. Uh, but most Bible teachers consider this to be one of the most practical books of the Bible. And it was written a little over a decade after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in A.D. 45 through 47, they say. And it addresses uh, topics in this series such as temptation, hypocrisy, prejudice, and it contains practical instructions on how to deal, excuse me, my, my excuse me, I got to take off my airplane, put my airplane mode on because I don't use Siri, but it came in for some reason, thought I was talking to it, excuse me, it was talking over it, and I know that my mic would have picked it up, and it was saying, uh, asking me a question, anyway, <clears throat> starting again. <laughs> but it does address topics such as temptation, hypocrisy, and prejudice. So it hits the hard subjects right in the face. And some people have written it and said, you know, you should read the book of James standing up because it, it's, it's a serious book, but it's a good book. Uh, it, it contains practical instructions on how to deal with problems like deception and, uh, and discipline and controlling the tongue. It also teaches believers about recognizing godly wisdom, conflict, humility, priorities, patience, and faith. And we're going to cover a whole lot of that stuff in these series. I said some of this in the first lesson. This is something new that I wanted you to know about. The name James is actually the English equivalent of the Hebrew name Jacob. And by calling this book James instead of Jacob, the church kind of loses a vital component of our Jewish beginnings. And uh, there, because there's no James in Greek, it's uh, Jacob. And we would never say that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and James, right? And neither should we call this the letter of James when it's in fact the letter of Jacob. But uh, we will. We're going to call it for, for, so it won't be confusing. But just so that you know this, it's an important thing. And also about, there are several men named James in the New Testament. I think it's good that you know some more about the person that wrote this. So two of Jesus' disciples were named James, or Jacob. And one disciple was the son of Alphaeus. He's also known as James the Less, or the Little, in some translations. And, one dis and some uh, say that he, he was called that because he was probably the shorter one of the two. So two of Jesus' disciples had the same name. This other disciple, not Alphaeus, but the other one was named James, was the son of someone that's a little more familiar. He was the son of Zebedee and Salome, also the brother of John, the one we were just talking about in the offering teaching. So um, John was also the writer of the Gospel of John, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation. So James and John worked with their father in their fishing business and were business partners with Peter uh, before Jesus called all of three of them into the soul winning business. He told them, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, right? And so they left their nets and their father's business. They were, they were probably prosperous people, and they followed Jesus. Matthew 20, 20 tells us that Salome, uh, James and John's mother uh, of these two brothers, asked Jesus a question. Just shows you a little bit about the whole family dynamic. She said, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and one on the left, in thy kingdom. And the whole, if you read that whole section of that chapter, it tells us how the other disciples resented these boys for wanting to be the best. And the first, they were, they were jockeying for positions. So they were growing. They're like us in a lot of ways. Character things that maybe we don't want to recognize that are there. But Jesus renamed this James and his younger brother John the sons of thunder because they wanted to call fire down from heaven on the people like, like that rejected Jesus, much like Elijah did. So uh, this is what was going on in this family. Uh, I'm just going to read these verses. You don't have to turn there, but Matthew 17, 
Verse 1 and 2 says, After six days, Peter taketh, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and bringeth them up on a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face shined as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. Why? Because these brothers, James and John, along with Peter, were, be- were very strong personalities, but they were the most intimate of Jesus' 12 disciples. It also talks about in Matthew 26, verse 36, 36 and 37, it says, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So they were in his inner circle. So this James, uh, that's the brother of John, was a significant person in the New Testament. Let's turn to Acts chapter 12. I want, you, I want to read, you to read what happened to this Apostle James, which was the uh, son of Zebedee. Acts chapter 12. I'd like you to see it for yourself. Because this is significant to what we're going to step into tonight. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. You know, history tells us that James was the first of the apostles to be murdered, and he was probably beheaded. And then uh, we're going to read this for ourselves here in verse chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So since he recognized this, it continues to say in that chapter that it pleased the Jews, so Herod then arrested Peter. Verses 5 through 19, which we're not going to read tonight, tells us that this is the situation where the angel came and freed Peter from prison. Y'all remember Jesse preached on this, who's knocking on someone's knocking on the door? Because he he was chained between two guards. The chains fell off. He got him out, broke him out of prison, but he told him to go, and he couldn't even get into church. Even though they were praying, he couldn't hardly get in there. uh, But that's that situation. This is that chapter where that happened. So... um, Peter, uh, at that point, that's when he went to a house, uh, the, a pe- to the group of people, the church that was gathered in the home of Mark's mother, to pray for him. And so they were praying, but after Peter's release, the Bible tells us in verse 23 that Herod dies suddenly. Mark, because he took the glory on for himself. You're probably familiar with that verse. But the date fixed from, from secular sources of Herod's death say that it is A.D. 44. So you know Herod killed James. And so um, here it is. This is 44. And this later we're going to show you that this is not the... That's why the Bible doesn't say James really specific, uh, which James, when it's reading it. So we want you to know. But he says that um, the apostle James, the son of Zebedee and Salome, was murdered before or during the same year that Herod died suddenly when the worms just kind of ate up on him. It was the judgment of God that came down on that wicked man. And so because of that, that ended like a third wave of persecution that was in Jerusalem, which probably began at 41 AD when Herod began his rule. So the other James, another James that's mentioned in verse 17 of the same chapter, and also in Acts 15, Acts 21, this, it mentions another James. And this is the James that wrote the New Testament book that we're studying in this message series. He's also the oldest half-brother of Jesus, which we know Jesus had uh, probably four half-brothers and at least two sisters, because they say Jesus' brothers and his sisters are with us, so it had to be at least two. And uh, so we know that these were not Jesus' full brothers, uh, brothers, because God, Jesus' father was God, and these j- boys and the sisters were fathered by Joseph after Jesus was born. Amen? So uh, if, if you have time to go through all the events between Acts 15 and 21, all those things that occurred, they, are, they record events that occurred between Paul and James and when they were together. And so they date everything between 48 and 52. So, it's on, so it just clarifies that James, uh, 
I hope I'm not losing you in the weeds. But it's clear that James, the apostle, brother of John, was not the one that wrote this book. This was a different person. So uh, most scholars uh, don't believe that James, the, the, bro the brother of, half-brother of Jesus, was a believer until after Jesus rose again from the dead, and then he believed him. Why do we know this? Do you know why we know this? John chapter 7, verse 3 through 5 says, His brethren therefore said to him, now this was before the, the, some, some festival that was about to happen, told them, that they, listen to the sarcasm in this. He says, they told his, Jesus, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy, di thy di disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. So they did not believe in him until after he rose. But after he rose, he became what, what Paul called a pillar in the church. You'll read that in Galatians. And he was also called an apostle at some point. So he had a bad beginning, but he ended good. As far as good as the word goes, but like his older brother Jesus, James also was stoned, was martyred. He was stoned to death for his faith in um, AD 62, according to the Jewish historian Josephus. So that's what happened to the one who we're reading about today. He laid his life on the line for this. And we're reading his precious words that were anointed by the Holy Spirit to help us. And this in-your-face kind of practical stuff that we all need. The meat and potatoes, right? We love the fried chicken, but sometimes you need the basics. We love the chocolate cake, and that's all good, but we need, the, we need it all. Amen? In our first lesson, I pointed out that James didn't identify himself as a church leader when he wrote his powerful letter. He also didn't identify himself as a brother of Jesus. He was the son of Mary and Joseph and the half-brother of Jesus, but he didn't identify himself in that way in the letter. He just began his letter by identifying himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. His greatest honor was to be considered a servant of Jesus Christ. So he wrote to the church in Jerusalem to the Jewish believers that were living in Asia, Europe, and Africa that were being persecuted for believing in Jesus Christ. Remember this, that uh, the church spread beyond Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because the Jews that had gathered there from all over the world had witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They had heard these 120 that were in the upper room that day. And uh, they were um, hearing about the wonderful works of God. And so, so much happened in that Time, the book of Acts records two huge increases in the early church. 3,000, uh, in chapter 2 says, souls were added, that, uh, were added to that, and that more were added daily. And in chapter 4, it talks about 5,000 people were born again. So they had it rocking, all right? They had a lot going on. So this is what was going on at this point in time. There was people getting saved every day. So along with increase of converts... The early church also began to experience an increase in persecution. And Stephen, we read in chapter, I think it's chapter 7 of Acts, was stoned to death while a young man named Saul was watching on. Amen. Saul was one, you know, that was later named Paul. Actually, it's a, just a Greek equivalent of his name. So um, this is in Acts chapter 1. Excuse me, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, meaning Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So except the apostles, one of those was James. He was still in Jerusalem, so he hears about all these people that have moved off and been scattered because of the persecution, and his heart goes out to them. He writes to them all these things he wanted them to know so that they would live a victorious life, so they would be able to be, uh, uh, live a holy life and follow the works of the teachings of Jesus. Amen? So uh, that's what he was wanting to do, just encourage them in their faith during these difficult times that they were encountering. And all of us, you know, we're not encountering the kind of things they did, but we encounter our own types of difficulties. And the principles that they learned there, 
that were taught there, we can learn from them as well. The part one of the study was titled Making Wise Decisions, and we learned that wisdom for making wise decisions had three distinct characteristics. It's practical, it's divine, and it's Christ-like. And knowing Christ personally is the greatest wisdom that anyone can have. I have reviewed so much and gone in detail about the, the background of the book. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get through the whole thing, but y'all work with me, okay? I hope y'all not in a hurry. <laughs> I only got three hours sleep last night, by the way. I was with Jesse in Mesa, Arizona. We had a powerful time, but we didn't realize the time changed with two hours ahead. So we got back like at 3 o'clock, and I got up like at 6.30, and, and I'm still going strong, hallelujah. But I have had a couple of cups of coffee, I must say. <laughs> But it's good, amen? amen. So uh, Jesus came, I wanted to just say this. The first, we read the first eight verses in part one, and we learned to count it all joy when we fall into different temptations. And we learned that temptations did not come from God. They all originate with the devil. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and he's given us power and authority over all the power of the devil. Amen. Amen. And we need to get this not just in our head, but get it in our heart and let it, let it be just like the good news, the gospel. So if he trespasses, he says, uh-uh, no, you have no right to be here. You take your position, you take your authority, and you have to, you enforce it with your mouth, with the words of your mouth when you speak what the word of God says. Amen. That's what faith does. Faith speaks. Hallelujah. So Jesus, uh, he gave us the power, but we learned that this was a joy strategy that empowers believers with divine strength to make wise decisions. So let's move on to part two, and this is called Avoiding Temptations. This section of the uh, scriptures we're going to read together is going to help us to learn some things of how we can be an overcomer in this life, even though we are uh, surrounded with such difficulty. You see, uh, James knew that the Christians that were scattered all over the world were facing challenges to their faith. And if they were to remain faithful, their beliefs needed to be intellectual, but they also needed to be practical. And he urged his readers to put their faith into action, and he taught them how to avoid temptations. Let's read James chapter 1. We're going to read all the way through from verse 9, which is where we left off last in the first part, all the way to verse 15, and then we'll discuss and teach that section. Verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For, no, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withered the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace fashioned of it perished, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. This is basically telling us we all have a level play playing field. You may have come into this thing wealthy. You may have come into this thing poor. But in God's eyes, we're all the same. The word will work for every one of us. Don't let anybody intimidate you. Say you're too good or you're not good enough. That's all this is really saying right here. Well, now, there's some other parts where James gets on the rich guys, the wicked rich. But this is some people that come into the church are not necessarily poor, but they're prosperous. You don't have to feel guilty because God's prospered you, but we're recognized you're not going to take that with you. We're all on this. We're going to, we're going to be, we should be good stewards of whatever God places in our hands and, and trust God. And those that, that come in with less, they can believe God to, to be blessed and have their needs met as well because the gospel is filled with those kind of truths. Uh, let's go on to verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he, tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So this is the, um, the example that James is giving them, how God is not one that tempts you, but inner desires respond to outward enticement, and sin is the result. So James doesn't mention Satan's role in temptation. His purpose is not to discuss the origin of sin, but to explain that the enticement or the luring to evil is not from God. Because a lot of people have this wrong understanding 
You know, they, they say, oh, you know, uh, God's teaching me something. God's put that, that, that uh, sickness on me to teach me. Yet they're taking medicine to get well. Why are you trying to go against the will of God? Will of God? Right? If God's teaching you something, keep learning. Don't take that medicine. Don't go to the doctor. You see how stupid that whole philosophy is? It's not biblically based. It's, 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 a, it's propaganda from the devil to keep people away from God. Because God's a good God. He doesn't tempt anybody with evil. And so this is what James is teaching them. Because that, that's not a new doctrine. It was back there in the early church. And... Uh, so there was no revelation of the devil pretty much in the Old Testament that Jesus came as the one who came to expose the thief. So everybody back then thought that everything good came from God, everything bad came from God, but that's not true. James setting it straight right here, amen? amen. So um, when, uh, he goes, Satan is the external source of temptation, but no way, we can't blame him. We have a free will. We can choose to follow God or to follow the devil. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. This is a key verse in this whole uh, teaching about avoiding temptation and identifying really what temptation is. Because <clears throat> there's really no excuse. We have a way out. We're going to see this. 1 John chapter 2. We have to always remember that no temptation is ever from God. Say this with me. No temptation, no temptation is ever from God. You have to settle that fact right off the bat. And let's read, let's read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So this is straight teaching right here. It really corresponds exactly with what James was teaching. The world is... is a morally evil system that is under the influence of Satan. It is opposed to God and to Christ's kingdom on this earth. And its purpose is to move you away from God and from his perfect plan for your life. So all temptation that is in the world appeals will appeal to your fleshly desires, both internal or external. So he named, numbered them in verse 16, the lust of the flesh. That means you're craving for physical pleasure, preoccupied with gratifying your physical desires. Uh, and the two was the lust of the eyes. That's craving for everything we see, coveting, accumulating things, bowing down to the God of materialism. That's the lust of the eyes. This is a, something that's in the world, and it's not of the Father, James, uh, John was telling us. And then the third one was the pride of life, pride in our achievements and possessions uh, uh, in the wrong way. I mean, you give God the glory is, is different, but if you, you act like you've done it all on your own and you don't need God, that's the wrong spirit. That's the pride of life. That's that self-righteousness that Jesus was always rebuking when he encountered those legalistic Pharisees. And it creeps in the church, you know. It creeps in our life if we don't watch out for it. So uh, we have sometimes get obsessed with our own status or our own importance. Even in the church, some people won't serve unless it can be recognized or honored in some way, and it's all the wrong spirit. This is why James is such a beautiful example. Even though he was the half-brother, he could have walked in and said, y'all get out of the way, I, 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 I'm, he's my brother. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to do that. Y'all, y'all get out of the way. Give me the best seat in the house. No, he said, I'm a servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is such a typical thing. These three things that, that John lists in his uh, epistle, First uh, John chapter two, verse sixteen. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father but it's of the world. So he's trying to open their eyes to that. That whole chapter is good, but we just grabbed that one verse because I wanted you to see that. You see, when the serpent tempted Eve, he tempted her in these same three areas that we read in John chapter uh, two, first, 1 John 2, 16. And, uh, and so Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, you may remember it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. 
He was with her, and he didn't speak up. We just and I, when we went to Venice, we saw Mark's Cathedral, St. Mark's Cathedral, and the beautiful square, and the, the guide that was showing it to us pointed out the carvings on the corner of the cathedral, and it was a carving of, of the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve was here, and the tree was kind of in between them, and they were both pointing the finger at each other. So uh, they blamed it on, on one other. We can't blame it on someone else. We can't even blame it on the devil. God will always give. We're going to see tonight that we will always have a way out. If you take ownership of your wrong decision, that's the only pathway toward your victory. Amen? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4 and see what Jesus did when he was tempted. Matthew chapter 4. Are y'all enjoying this teaching tonight? This is a good section of our teaching, even though it's not in the book of James. We're just taking a small section, but it deals specifically with avoiding temptation and showing you how Jesus did not uh, fall to the temptation of the devil. When he was tempted in the wilderness, these were the same three areas that we just read about in uh, 1 John that was under the attack, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's read Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up, are y'all there at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1? Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. I want you to notice that the temptation of the Son was God's idea. Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness. This tells us that God was not on the defensive in this matter. He was on the offenses, offensive, demonstrated the superiority of his son over Satan. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're not going to go there, but verse 45 and 47 describes Jesus as the second man or the last Adam. See, the first Adam was tested in the garden, we just read about that, and he gave in to Satan and got the human race kicked out into the wilderness. The last died, Adam, who was that? Jesus, went into the wilderness to defeat Satan so that he could escort us back into the garden. Amen. Into the good life. Amen? It's the good life. That's what God wants for us. Amen? Adam and Eve lost it. Jesus bought it back. And to the degree that you will believe it, you will walk in that garden life too. Amen? Let's read Matthew, continue reading Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, what was his name? The tempter came to him. He said, if thou, if, see there's that if, that same if that Satan used in the garden on Adam and Eve. If, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You see, to fast is to give up a physical craving to fulfill a spiritual need. It prioritizes feeding the spirit with prayer and fellowship with God over feeding the stomach. And clearly the devil had been watching Jesus go without food. I've heard it said that when you start to hunger again after, this, after a long fast, that's when it's really a serious matter. Your body's basically eating itself or something like that. I'm not positive if that's true, but... It was a serious thing that he did it at that point, after 40 days. So he knows what you're up to, and he redirects, he directs his temptations accordingly. He's been around a long time. That's why we need the Holy Ghost every day. Amen? Let's continue reading Jesus' answer, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. He says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus was actually quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And after 40 days without food, he was hungry. He was tempted with, the, well, I guess you'd call it the lust of the flesh. This body wanted food. It's a normal, he's human. He put on humanity. He put aside his divinity when he came on the earth and lived as a man on the earth to show us that we can defeat the devil as, as a human being as well. He did this for us, Amen. So uh, if Jesus, uh, you see, he was tempted with the lust of the flesh, but he did not yield to it and sin against God. If Jesus, the living word, needed to use the written word to deal with the enemy of the word, 
how much more to you? Think about that. I'm going to say that again. If Jesus, the living word, what does it say? In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. Right? And he walked among us. He says, if Jesus, the living word, needed to use the written word to deal with the enemy of the word, how much more do we? Amen? Amen. So he gave us the Bible so that we could wield it like a sword. This is our sword of the spirit. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's continue reading Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Then the devil taketh him up to the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash dash thy foot against a stone. So here he was challenging Jesus to jump to his death. You know, it doesn't sound like a temptation, does it, to some people. But notice he supported his appeal by quoting God's promise of angelic protection. He was quoting the word, misquoting the word. Psalms uh, 91, y'all probably recognize it, verse 11 and 2, but he misquoted it. Anyway, Jesus then had an opportunity at that moment to demonstrate undeniably that he was the Messiah. The problem was that if he did it, he would, would be ignoring God's plan. And it would bike past the cross. But the devil knows the Bible and he used it. But, so, but Jesus could not be tempted in this way. He did not yield to that. <clears throat> See, if he can't convince you to act independently of God, he'll tempt you to, with pride of life so that you'll work through your religion. You know, you'll just get prideful. So that's what was going on there. Let's continue reading Matthew chapter 4, verse <clears throat> 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 right there. And in other words, Jesus knew that we are never to, be, to use disobedience to back God into a corner in order to force him to fulfill his plan. Right? So we have to use wisdom. There's always, I mean, the devil's stupid. He'll tell you, once you just jump in front of that car, God's going to protect you. Why don't you just throw yourself down? He told Jesus, you're going to get protected. Your angels are going to protect you. You have to be wiser than him. He's crazy. We all know that. Let's continue reading verse 8. I'm trying to get through it. Are y'all following me? Verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up to exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, "Uh, all these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Wow. Now, Luke's gospel gives the same account. It's a little different order. But in Luke's gospel, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 7, in the Amplified, he says the, adds the word just once. If you'll fall down and worship me just once, he said he'd give him all of that stuff. See, Satan really wants us to bow down to him. That's his, he's always wanted, what God, he want, always wanted God's glory, and he's using this on Jesus himself. And so he'll make tempting offers to get us to, do the, do, to bow down to him, but they're never worth the price. And this is an example of the lust for the eyes. Continue reading Matthew 4, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. If you're a Christian, you have no obligation to the devil. You have Jesus' delegated authority against him. In the same way Jesus defeated him with the word of God, God will give you the words to say in those moments as well. So when temptation comes, you can avoid it by speaking the word of God and trusting God to give you the words to speak with authority and and take your position. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a shout for that. That's good stuff right there. So it's not a sin to be tempted because Jesus, we just saw, was tempted. It's only a sin to yield to temptation. But Jesus did not. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. I'm just going to read it to you because we don't have time to turn there, but you can write down the reference. You'll be familiar with this, most of you. It says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are yet without sin. So this clarifies it right there. Even though he did face temptation in that, in that wilderness, he did not sin. That's who we serve. Amen. Jesus 
uh, is like us, that was telling, telling the high priest in many ways, because he was human, because he experienced the full range of temptations throughout his life as a human being. So it comforts us to know that because he was victorious, he wants to help us to be victorious as well. Hallelujah. Uh, we can be encouraged knowing that Jesus faced temptation without giving in to sin. He shows us that we don't have to sin as well. He was the only perfect human being who has ever lived. And I'm so thankful for the mercy of God because none of us even come close to him. But his mercy helps us. If we just plead, mer plead for mercy, Lord, help me. I, I knew I blew it right there. I know I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I, I, you know, I was wrong. You know, own it. Some people just never learn to say the basic things that are so important to everybody to learn, even as a kid. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. It's not that hard. But when you start doing it and meaning it from your heart, it really changes you. I told that to my daughter one time. She says, Mama, they don't want to hear that you're wrong. They want to hear that they're right. So she says, four things. You were right. I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's her version of it, which I think is hilarious. But it's really true. But that's not a good thing either if you think about it. We should, and I was, we, I just, um, we did a great TV, pro, uh, Glorious Living program with Tyler and uh, his dad, uh, Terry James, it's going to air the first Friday, I think, in June. And it's basically father-son relationship. They work together. And we're talking about forgiveness, how it's important. And I remember something that I heard Brother Hagen say many years ago. It's always stuck with me. And he says, you know, there's only really two times in the Bible when you're supposed to forgive someone. It's when someone has an ought against you or you have an ought against them. So I think that covers it all. So walking in forgiveness is, is a good thing. Even Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because everybody that we encounter in this life, we're, we're in this world where there is a tempter. And he's doing this to not just you, he's doing it to others. So we need to be more merciful to others and extend mercy because we need it too. We need it extended back to us. Amen? Glory to God. So Jesus is the perfect high priest. He can sympathize with our weakness and our suffering. But he resisted completely, and so can he can help us do the same. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let me just jot down here. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm trying to get through this and give you what God gave me for us tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, in a culture that's filled with moral depravity, depravity and sin-inducing pleasures, this verse reveals us how we can avoid temptation. See, temptation comes to everybody because uh, the, the devil is no respecter of persons. He comes at everyone. But we don't have to feel that we've been singled out. Uh, but others have resisted temptation. Jesus is our, is our, our example, and so can we. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13, I just have one more verse after this, so we're, we're, we're good on the time, unless the Lord does something else. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, are you there? Yeah. He says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but with, will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what God said about the situation. So we can resist any temptation because God will make a way of escape. Hallelujah. How he will help you. How will he help you? I have five ways. Number one, he will help you to recognize those people and situations that give you trouble. You recognize, oh, oh, that wasn't a good choice. I'm going to go, I'm going to go another way. Recognize those people, those wrong situations, those wrong connections, those wrong relationships that don't bring you down the way that you know God wants you to go. Amen? He'll help you also, number two, to run from anything that you know is wrong. There's, a, there's something within each one of us, whether you know God or not, that tells you the difference between right and wrong. We, I taught this when I taught on the book of Romans, how even if they've never heard the word, there's something inside of every human being that they know when they're doing something wrong. 
Whether they say that with their mouth or not, inside there's something that God put in us. Amen. So you have to run from what you know is wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict you. He will direct you. And you have to learn to listen and obey. That's how God's going to help you avoid temptation. Number three, he'll, he'll help you to choose to do only what is right. Do the right thing and do it right. Choose to do only what is right. If that's your purpose in life, if that's your motive, God is going to help you to do that. He's going to show you. And sometimes it's going to be hard because you're going to be in the middle of people who want to do the wrong thing. It's going to be hard to, to make that stand at some point. But you have to, when you make that stand, it will get easier and easier each time. Amen? Uh, God will help you also. Number four, pray for God's help. He's going to show you how to pray. And if you don't know what to pray, you hit it in tongues, and the Holy Spirit fills you with new strength, and he builds up your, your spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, builds up your most holy faith with that. Or, but he can show you how to pray. He'll teach you his word. Amen. Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our comforter. He will help us. Amen? If you truly want help, you will get it. He won't leave you out there all by yourself. I was out there all by myself when I got born again, when I was in a bath. I was in, um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in that little hotel room with my little one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. My husband was a rock entertainer doing his show up there, doing who knows what. I don't even want to think about it. It's under the blood. Hallelujah. But here I am. I, did, I didn't know what I was doing. And there it is. And God touched me. And then I got born again. I prayed that prayer when I heard Billy Graham preach on TV. And my life was so radically changed. It was night and day. Even though I had a, Jesse laughs about it when I first told him that I got, I prayed the prayer. He says, you didn't have anything to give up. And I had a, a witness in my heart. I said, look, I was, I'm go, I was going to the same place that you're going to right now, brother. And so... Uh, <laughs> God helped me to see that right off the bat, even though I had never read the Bible before then. So here I am, I get born again because I heard a prayer on TV, and then I, I, I'm total, I know I'm changed. I pick up the Gideon Bible, start reading it. I call Jesse's mom and dad at, at their house, and they helped me understand what being saved really meant. And here I am, I'd find a church whenever I could, when, whenever we weren't traveling, and I would get in church, I'd read the Bible every day, and God was helping me. So if he will do that for me all by myself, my God, you got this whole church around you. You have, you have, we have so much today. There's Christian television. There's so many great things on social media that we can feed our spirit with. The Holy Spirit has given us so many great tools for these last days. And we need to take advantage of all of them. Amen? Give the Lord a shout for that. So he says, the fourth thing is pray for God's help. And I did that, and he gave me help. And, I, and it helped me to grow. That's been since 1973, uh, in the month of May, actually, by the way. So it's 51 years. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. 51 years. I know I don't look it. No, I'm <laughs> yes, I do. Anyway, the fifth one, God will help you to seek friends who love God and can offer help when you are tempted. That's why it's so important to have a church family. Seek friends who will love God and can offer help when you are tempted. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is our last scripture for tonight in my King James Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his spiritual son. And so I believe that it's, it's important. It's something he really wanted him to know. Now, he had poured his life into him, nurtured him. He was, some called him his protege. He was, um, at some point, Timothy was the, chap the pastor of the church of Ephesus, and he wrote to him there, so, and he uh, was a good, a strong believer. But here, this is what he wrote to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, we're going to end on this scripture. It says, flee also youthful lusts. So he was a young man. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, Charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Praise the Lord. This is wise advice for avoiding temptation. What is it? Flee and follow. Flee and follow. There are two, def, two Fs. Flee and follow. We don't use the word flee too much. It means run. Run. Run away from that. You don't need any part of it. Run with your heart, not just your feet. It's not enough to walk away and think, oh, I wish I'd be doing that. Let your mind go on it. 
You let your mind soar. No, you got to take control of this mind. Pull it down. Take the battlefield many times is in the mind anyway. Starts there many times. So you have to take authority over that. So you should flee or run from a tempting situation and follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. So surround yourself with like, right, like precious faith, people, other believers that love God and are, are, are just as committed as you are. Surround yourself with people that are 100% going for, forward with God, and you're going to avoid temptation. That's one part of it. Amen? So, uh, and next week, we're going to continue with part three in our Bible study in the book of James. We're going to learn about being a doer of the word. Hallelujah. I can't believe it. I made it. 830. Hallelujah. Glory. Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. I just want to say one thing that really blessed me a few weeks ago. I got a, a text from Rick Renner. He is such a dear friend. He, he's actually got a text to me, and he says, I heard that he had heard that I'd begun a, begun a message series on the book of James, and he sent this email to Mary from me. Mary's uh, Jesse's secretary, and she's, I don't know why he didn't send it straight to me, because we go back and forth with texts as well. He says, I see on Facebook that Kathy is going to be teaching the book of James. I have been working on my RIV, which is Renner's Interpretive Version, of James with footnotes, and I thought Kathy might want to see it, and I'm attaching it to this email. Can you please print it out and give it to her for me? I have not done chapter five yet, so it's missing in this file. Please tell Jesse and Kathy hi from Denise and me. Right now we're headed to the mountains of Ararat to do a full documentary on the ark and the flood. How exciting is that? Well, I just got a text from him yesterday. He says, how's that, math, how's that James teaching going? And I told him that I, that I just loved having his, his footnotes and all that, how much of a blessing it is and how much we love him. But I consider him an, uh, an excellent Bible teacher. And, and I sent him a quick text when he had sent that, that I was teaching it. He, says, uh, he said back to me, uh, I saw that you were teaching James and I thought it might be a help to you. You probably don't need help, but since I worked on it, I wanted to share it with you and sure love you and Jesse. I said, my reply to him was, are you kidding me? <laughs> I told him that I often use his, his books, especially his sparkling gems, when I research things to get a clearer meaning because he's such a Greek scholar. He's such a beautiful teacher, uh, and, and he explains the customs of the period as well. And I told him he was a wonderful blessing to me and the body of Christ. I did copy that portion of the scripture. If y'all would like me to read it in his Rick Renner version, he calls it the ear, uh, uh, R.I.V. Renner's interpretive version of verse 9 through 15 that I just taught on. Would you like to hear it? I don't think it'll take us more than five minutes or less to just to read it through, just to see, because he's very wordy, but it's very clear. Uh, I'll do it. Does anybody not want it? You can go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but please don't. You'll, you'll regret it. Trust me. He says, verse 9, I know there are those among you who have really experienced difficult hardships, and the brother who's gone through a humbling ordeal may feel a little embarrassed. But it's time to shrug it off and to hold your head up, for even though you've been through a humbling experience, you've ele you elevated status in life as a child of God and as one that will be richly rewarded in the future means you have a reason to shout. Verse 10, but, but, think, uh, but then I also want to say something to those who are doing well financially and are materially blessed. If that's you, then you need to hold your head uh, high and rejoice too. For the reality is everything you have is temporal. Eventually those riches will pass, and when they do, you'll find yourself just like everyone else just like a beautiful and blossoming flower that seems so beautiful in one moment but doesn't last very long. The rich man's status will eventually just pass away. Verse 11, for just as the scorching heat of the sun eventually shrivels the grass of the field, a time eventually comes when a blossoming flower wilts and its loveliness appearance comes to an end. In the same way, the one who is financially and materially blessed eventually finds his life begin to waste away even while he's still active in his various endeavors. Verse 12, supremely blessed, 
happy and to be envied is the man who made the choice to dig in his heels, stick it, and who turned down every opportunity to quit, even those situations arose to stop him and to bring distraction to his life. This reason such a person is blessed because by him choosing to push back and stay in faith, he has proven his faith is the real deal. The test may have been an intended to crush him, but by standing firm, in the end, he's been validated. As a result, he'll receive a glorious victor's crown, a crown that brings a physical and spiritual reward in life now and for eternity. And this, a, and this reward that is promised to those, this is a reward that is promised to those who make it their goal to continually cherish and love him. Isn't this beautiful? Amen. Verse 13. Amen. Let no one, not even the smallest hint, ever say or even dare to suggest when he is going through really difficult times or ordeals that are crushing that I am being subject, subject, subject to these difficult ordeals and hardships by the permissive will of God. See, because some people even say, yeah, God didn't do it, but he's allowing it. This is fighting this. This is truth. Because there's such a thing as the permissive will. And anyway, we're not going to get him. Go back to Brother Rick. I, uh, he says for, uh, I, I mean, this is a quote. He says that somebody's saying, don't ever say this. I am being subjected, subjected to these difficult ordeals and hardships by the permissive will of God. For working behind the scenes remotely and from a distance, God has obviously permitted all of this to happen to me, close quote. And then he goes on to say, for the fact is that God is evil free, hyphen, evil dash free, evil free, and has no capacity and no experience with what is evil, foul, and destructive. There is no evil in God, which means he never intentionally puts anyone through difficult and grueling experiences to test them. It is not within the realm of possibility for an evil, free God to be behind anything that brings destruction in a person's life. I love that. Amen. That is out as clear as it can be. Amen? Amen. God's a good God. Don't, don't give him that bad rap. Don't line up with what the world's saying about God. You know, how God, and even in insurance policies, they'll call it an act of God. God didn't do that. There's an evil tempter in the earth. The, world, the world's upside down because of sin, and that's what's going on in the world when you see storms and tornadoes. Jesus rebuked them. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 14. We're getting there, guys. But if you really want to know how evil and destruction finds its way into a person's life, here it is, colon. Every single person, without exception, ends up in a place of breakdown and failure when he is lured from a place of safety into a place of vulnerability. It all started with him being lured out by the pull of his own fleshly desires. It is similar to a fisherman who baits a hook and dangles it in front of a fish. Eventually, the fish looks at it for so long that it goes out for the bait. In the same way, fleshly temptation baits people and seductively entices them to go for it and to do what they shouldn't do. Amen? Amen. Verse 15, it says, And when that ill-fated desire has been entertained mentally for so long that a person conceived it and becomes pregnant with it, eventually that unfettered embryonic temptation is fully developed. A moment comes when that person gives birth to behaviors that miss the mark of what is right and wrong and are sinful. You see, when the gestation for this destructive process is complete, it finally gives birth, and what gives birth to is permeated with every kind of death. Praise the Lord. So that is so clear and so beautiful. I thank Brother, Brother Rick for sending us this so that we can see just how important these scriptures are to know what is how to avoid temptation and how it starts when we're pulled away and we yield to that. And it first starts out as sin, but it, eventually it's death. 
And we're, we're not just talking about physical death, we're talking about spiritual death. So there, that's, a, that's what could happen. So we all want to avoid temptation at any cost. So I hope you don't mind me going a little 10 minutes over. Let's everybody bow your heads. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We close tonight in reverence for you and for your word, thanking you, Lord, for teaching us, for showing us and get, equipping us so that we can live as overcomers in this life. Lord, and be, bring glory to your name. Lord, we never want to cast a reflection on you. Lord, we want to be a reflection of you. And Lord, I thank you that we have been equipped by the Holy Ghost to live an overcoming life, to be free from temptation. Lord, that, to be free from the sin that, that temptation brings. Lord, I thank you that you equipped us to know how to be strong in you, and that's to yield to your spirit instead of yielding to our flesh and our own ways. We trust you, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, tonight. Lord, as a people, Lord, we just search our own hearts. Lord, if there are any areas within us that, that we've yielded and gone the wrong way, Lord, correct it. Show it to us. Lord, we rep I repent now. Lord, if there's anything in my life that I, I know I must have missed the mark so many times, and sometimes I'm not even aware of it till later. But Lord, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is ever leading, ever forgiving, ever trusting, guiding. With a gentle hand, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you recognize us all as your dear children. Lord, our, our, I believe I'm saying what is in the heart of most here tonight, all of us here tonight, that we truly just want to do your will and to please you in everything. Help us today, Lord, to be good children, to be good sons and daughters for you, to walk in your ways. Equip your, Lord, we thank you that you have already equipped us with everything that we need to live a godly and a holy life. Lord, I thank you that there's no temptation that comes against us that, that's not common to man. Lord, if, that you have restricted the devil, and Lord, you have freed your church. Lord, I thank you that you've given us power and authority over all the works of the devil. And in the same way that Jesus gave, was our example, and he resisted temptation, we can as well. And we thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you that we have an opportunity to come together as believers and learn about how strong we really are in you. Although the devil lies to tell us we're weak, no, Lord, we know we're strong. And Lord, we declare that when we're, we, even when we feel weak, we're going to say, Lord, we're strong because we're strong in you and you're equipping your people today to live the way you called us to live. And Lord, I thank you there's freedom in that. Lord, I thank you that you freed us from all condemnation. Lord, because we know we don't get any of this in our own strength. We get it from knowing you and walking with you. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I pray for every person in here. Would y'all just stand to your feet? We're just going to spend a little, we're going to close in a time of worship. Just one song. I know Renee is such a blessing. If you need prayer tonight, I'd love to pray with you. I know some of you may have to leave. Some can stay a little longer. I'm not in a hurry. My husband's way over in Colorado. He's going to be back late. So I'm, I'm just, just going to soak in the presence of God. If there's something in your life that you need, let's just lift our hands and pray individually. Pray in your heart. And if you need someone to agree with you, I'm here tonight with you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hello, Jesse here. I know you've been blessed today and you don't want to miss any of our upcoming videos. That's why you need to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell. That notification bell lets you know when we post new videos. So like, subscribe, and hit the bell. See you next time. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.